In this way, Christ can live his life in and through you. A friend of mine lived in a palatial home in El Paso. He was very successful, had accumulated considerable wealth, but once a week he would minister to the poor people in Juarez, Mexico. But there was this one woman who greatly ministered to him. She lived in a little hut with a dirt floor. Her earthly possessions were a little stove, a pot, a pan, a plate, knife, fork, spoon, one change of clothes. Every time she saw him, she would tell him, God is so good to me. He is so wonderful and faithful and real to me. Yes, this successful businessman was a Christian and loved God, but here was this poor, godly woman demonstrating a life of joy and victory and love that my friend had never known. Through her, he discovered that our joy and fulfillment is not found in material possessions, but in our relationship and obedience to God. Jesus instructs us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. As a result, we shall enjoy the rewards of righteous living and agree with King David. For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. So um, we need to come up with some new ideas in the morning and uh, hash it out. What do you well, think? No, I'm telling you, Jeff, we've got to come up more hard self. That's, I mean, you know, it's this Mr. Nice Guy stuff just does not, you know, cut it in the long run. Oh, I'm Mr. Nice Guy? Well, you know, I mean, I just, I want to come out both guns blazing and I want you to uh, kind of be there too, you know. Well, I'll be there. <laughs> Good night, Rhonda. <laughs> what is it? Good night. <laughs> what? She gave me her room number. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, buddy, you were a lucky man. No, oh, I'm telling you, we're knocking on her door, a little champagne. It's a hot time in the old town tonight. <laughs> Help me, Rhonda, yeah. <laughs> Have you forgotten I'm a married man? So, what? 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 You think your wife knows what happens 2,000 miles away from home? Oh, and this is how you would explain it to your wife, huh? For her? In a heartbeat. Oh, man. I gotta admit, I'm tempted. Yeah, just uh, make sure you tell me all about it tomorrow, okay? No, I can't. I can't. You know, our wives may not be able to see what's going on 2,000 miles away, but, uh, well, let's just say I know somebody who can. What, a little birdie? Your wife knows a psychic? What? No, no psychics. I'm talking about God. Oh, Jeffy, come on. Now, don't get religious on me. This is Rhonda. Nah, Steve, we're doing You know he knows when we violate our word or, or hurt the people we love. You come on. You, you know there's consequences. They may not happen right away, but there are consequences. You know, I would have a great time in there tonight. Uh, yeah, I'd say. But you know it wouldn't last, right? Look, you can't just spit in the face of God and expect to get away with it. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, well, <clears throat> good for you. And you know what? I, I, I really hope you enjoy your lonely little room tonight. <laughs> Don't you worry about me. I'm going to be fine. But remember something. There are benefits to doing the right thing, like a clear <sighs> conscience and... Uh, Maybe a good night's rest. See you tomorrow. I have a medical condition, all right? And next time I'm not picking up the check. The Bible declares righteousness exalts a nation. 
but sin is a disgrace to any people. But what does that mean? We know that our God is a righteous God, and we understand that as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to live righteous lives. But how does that righteousness impact the course of a nation? In the book of Deuteronomy, God promised to bless the nation of Israel for obedience. But he also warned of judgment upon their people if his laws were disregarded. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 through 10, he speaks of a similar warning that could be applied to any nation. These scriptural principles were well understood by the pilgrims and the founders of our nation. Their purpose, as stated in the New England Charter, was to advance the enlargement of the Christian religion to the glory of God Almighty. America has a unique biblical heritage, a heritage rooted in a dependence on God and His principles. 99% of the colonial population profess to be Christians, and most of our founding fathers were true followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, and they dedicated this country to Him. It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Gentlemen, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. The Christian religion is the most important and one of the first things in which all children under a free government ought to be instructed. All of the first 100 or more early colleges and universities of our nation, including Harvard, Princeton, Dartmouth, Yale, William and Mary, Columbia and others, were founded primarily to train young scholars in the knowledge of God and the Bible. Bible knowledge was regarded as the foundation of other branches of wisdom and understanding. Even a century later, Abraham Lincoln said, but for the Bible, we would not know right from wrong. The influence of the Bible was also basic to the decisions of the Supreme Court. Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty, as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation, to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. The First Amendment was never intended to remove the influence of Christianity from government. It was rather a safeguard to make sure that government would never impose restrictions upon the free exercise of religion. John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States, supported this position. The highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It connected in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government and the principles of Christianity. Even in 1892, the U.S. Supreme Court made the following ruling. No purpose of action against religion can be imputed to any legislation, state or nation, because this is a religious people. This is a Christian nation. That court ruling was based on 87 different historical precedents. Despite all these historical precedents, in 1947, a bloodless revolution began to change America. Without a single precedent, the Supreme Court declared the separation of church and state, and in fact, the words separation of church and state are not found anywhere within the Constitution, but rather have been taken out of context from a letter written by Thomas Jefferson. Then, in 1962 and 1963, 
The Supreme Court declared school prayer to be unconstitutional and the Bible was outlawed from our schools. There was no legal precedent or historical basis for these court decisions, but those decisions became a major turning point in moving our nation away from God and true righteousness. Soon afterwards, the Supreme Court legalized the murder of our unborn babies and made it unlawful to display the Ten Commandments in public schools. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Early in the 19th century, the French statesman Alexandre de Tocqueville made a study of democracy in our country and came to this conclusion. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her public school system and her institutions of learning, and it was not there. Not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. As a result of these infamous Supreme Court decisions, our society has plummeted into moral and spiritual bankruptcy. God's righteous foundation in America is being systematically destroyed. And as the foundation crumbles, so does the nation. It is obvious from every social indicator that the world system has failed. We as believers dare not continue to be silent. As Christians, we must hold fast to the righteous standards set forth by the sovereign ruler of the universe. Regardless of the beliefs and behavior of a nation, ultimately, every person will be held accountable by God according to his biblical standards. Whose standards will you follow? God's or man's?